All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to a new day. And uh, before we begin this session, let's just pray and uh, we'll get into our teaching. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much once again for giving us this beautiful day. And even as we come together to learn, Lord, uh, about cell groups and about discipleship, Lord, we thank you that you will enable us to learn and apply everything that we learn, Lord, into our lives, into our ministries, uh, to bear fruit for your kingdom, Lord. We, we just submit this time into your hands. We pray, God, that our hearts will be open to receive from you, God. And uh, uh, we thank you, Lord, for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Uh, so last class on Wednesday, we, we looked at chapter 8, the administrative side of um, of cell groups. So we looked at how as cell groups increase in numbers, uh, you know, you you and I can appoint associate cell group pastors and there are rules and uh, regulations that the associate cell pastors must follow, right? They have certain responsibilities that they must fulfill. Uh, and, and over time, right, um, like I mentioned last class, you know, right now you may be having a church or you may be having a ministry which is just maybe one or two life groups but always look ahead think ahead think five years down the line right and uh, uh, you don't have to share everything uh, immediately but at the right time you could just bring in whatever plan and strategy you have placed and then we also looked at um, becoming a cell church the essence of a cell church we look at relationships, participation, empowering, focusing on Jesus, outreaching, outreaches, sorry, uh, networking, and uh, adaptable structures. Meaning, be open to uh, you know different cultures, be adaptable as a cell group. Okay, so let's get into chapter eleven, and we've come back uh, to the from the practical side, we've come back a little bit to the spiritual side now, right? And uh, we're talking about prayer, right? Now, when, when you know, everything we do in our life or in ministry, work, anything, family, must be undergirded through prayer, right? Uh, uh, you know, if we don't pray, we can only get by to a certain limit. That's God's grace, right? It is prayer that upholds us. It is prayer that gives us the wisdom. It is prayer that gives us the strength. The, uh, uh, the, it is prayer that keeps us in good health. So prayer as a believer, right? Uh, not only as a leader, but as a believer, prayer must be number one priority. Look at Jesus. What did he do? Uh, in his busy schedules, in his busy busy uh, doing ministry, but he never compromised on prayer. Prayer is what can hold things together, right? Uh, uh, I'm I'm sure you've heard of that saying, right? A family that prays together stays together, right? You, you can have a family that's everyone are working, children are doing well, everything is fine, but can easily break if there's no prayer. Prayer, right? Prayer is the essence of our life. It is, it should be something very natural, right? Uh, and I, you know, a lot of youth, especially, you know, they come and ask, how, co how, how can I improve my prayer life? And the first thing I always encourage young people is I, we know, you know, there's so much of distractions uh, that our mind can go all over the place. The first thing I always encourage our youth is to do something for 30 days straight. That becomes a habit. And so if you want to pray, if you set your mind, okay, I'm going to pray 30, 30 minutes in the morning. Oh. You know, 15 minutes of prayer or 15 minutes of reading the word. Do it for 30 days straight and you will realize that it's become a habit. So for believers, you know, prayer should be a natural, a very natural outflow. 
now when you are a leader in a church or leader in a cell group or ministry this you know the the bar is set higher and so it, it's not like you know we can just do one five ten minute prayer and get by doing our ministries doesn't work that way that's why it says here pray and more prayer right pray for your cell group remember that your your as a leader or your uh, you know uh, as part of the cell group you are ministering to people so what are you doing you are sowing seeds of the word of god you're sowing things into their life and you're impacting the kingdom of god now the moment you do that there's another person waiting the enemy is waiting to you know steal that seed or steal the joy that you are working for for right so pray for yourself group pray for your cell members every day regularly pray for them right now now especially now, now you have probably about 10 people in your cell group use their name and pray say i pray for them i pray for their family i pray for their children i pray for their uh, you know their their work and their personal lives uh, what are you doing you know you are getting into a place of warfare so you're standing in the gap and you're praying for your cell members right then you can pray for your pastors family the church needs in a cell group meeting pray for the members and for their oikos who need to be reached that means for, for the people who they can go and reach out to pray for your cell members right we must seek a high level of holy spirit involvement through powerful prayer based right seek a high level of the empowering of the holy spirit uh, let me just uh, see if i can just present the notes right uh, okay now when we talk about uh, seeking a higher level of empowerment involvement by the holy spirit is it basically means that we are not just making prayers you know that remember as children we we would learn those prayers and we just keep saying those psalms especially right and i remember growing up uh you know psalms 100 psalms 23 we would just say it without even knowing what it means right but that's not what we when we say prayer that's not what it is it's not just you know babbling off something but we must seek the involvement of the holy spirit we must be intentional in asking god to move in asking god to minister to yourself in, in your cell group right ask uh, the holy spirit to begin to get more involved in the things of the cell group right and remember when you when you have a cell group you also have times of discussion you have times of prayer you have times where people will come up to you as leaders they'll say can you pray for me and they many people will have many 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 problems now if we don't have a good platform of a good prayer life we may just pray and god is you know god is great he's able to bring healing yes but we need to ask for a for the anointing for the holy spirit to move right a strong platform prayer platform in the church causes the anointing of the holy spirit to come and when the anointing of the holy spirit comes uh you know people who hindrances are broken off yokes are broken off people begin to uh, walk in a greater level of maturity right there is protection there is unity right unity is very important as a cell group right we talked about that now how does unity come when we get the holy spirit when we pray and we say god bring us in unity bring us in one mind in one heart uh, that we're doing this for your kingdom right then there is salvations there is healings there is miracles right and and pray for the accomplishment of specific goals for your for yourself and for the church right 
So basically, the essence of what we're trying to say is, as a cell church, as a cell, and as leaders in ministry, we must be people who pray. Right? Now, here's some things that I personally help uh, with. You know, now, so for example, we have about uh, I think about 15 youth groups, right? Now, we know they are young people in their early 20s, right? They may not be able to sit for hours and pray. Right, it's it's practical. It's thinking practically. They're young. They're youth, right? Um, and they're not able to sit for. You can't expect them to sit for one hour and pray for everyone in your cell group, right? They they may not be able to do that, right? Or they may not be at that level yet. If they are, that's wonderful. You encourage them. Uh, but they, if they are not there, as a leader, right? Uh, uh, what you can do is you encourage these young men and uh, you know the youth especially. Encourage them. Tell them, hey, why don't you, you know, spend fifteen minutes in prayer? Pray for your cell group. These are things that you can pray for, and you're encouraging them to pray, right? Now remember, it's very easy to judge them. Hey, being a cell group leader, why are you not praying? It's easy to say that, but it's easier to give a solution to the problem that they're facing, right? So you can tell them these are some things that you can read and i remember you know just sharing the simple thing that i did personally right so i bought a notebook when i was a student and i began to write down verses all the verses so i had one section of all the verses of health and healing one section of all the verses of you know god as our strength and our and our refuge and our fortress one section was the you know the uh, as as you know verses of battle right uh, verses of victory so i wrote them all down so probably about i don't know maybe 300 odd verses but over time you just begin to write them and then what happens is it it goes into you right and and so some things i encourage our youth leaders is youth uh, lg leaders is you write it down so when you write it down and you're ministering to people. They say, "Hey, you know what? I'm 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 feeling very low. I feel suicidal. What can you do?" Immediately, you remember some of the verses that you've written. Say, "Okay, hey, the Bible says, I do not have the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and sound mind. I have the mind of Christ, and the wisdom of God is formed within me." So, as a leader, what are you doing? You're not just giving random ideas. No, no, don't. Don't kill yourself. It's good to be alive. It's, that's very random. But you're giving the word of God. You're giving good. Uh, you know, you're, you're as a leader, you're able to minister to them through the word of God, which is the most powerful way of ministering to them. Right? So these are some practical things, right? Uh, that you, as a leader, can help your cell group leader. If you are a cell group leader, and you are uh, not doing this. I encourage you, right? It's not like you have to do it, but I encourage you to do it, right? Take some time. Uh, over time, right? You just begin to write down verses. And what happens is it's like a, uh, you know, uh, I've used this allegory once, you know, it's like a, you know, a tank. And then you keep putting the word of God inside that tank. You fill up that tank with the word of God. And one day, uh, you know, you got to keep using that. You know, you own the tap for the water to come out. And when you own the tap, what's going to happen? The word of God is going to just come out because it's already there in the storage. And at the right time, the Holy Spirit will use those verses to minister to people, right? So as leaders, undergird your life with prayer. If prayer is not a part of your life as, you know, if you're as a believer or as a leader, Go back. Go back to that prayer closet, right? Go back to that place and say, God, I'm not going to try to do anything on my own, but I'm going to depend on you. I'm going to trust in you. And I always tell our young people, our youth, especially youth uh, life group leaders and those who are young, you know, push yourself. Right? Push yourself when you're young because as you, you know, you can't expect to do the same thing when you're 50 or 60. Push yourself. Give your best for God when you're young. 
right? And um, uh, you know, this coming week, I'm meeting with all the youth life group leaders, and just talking about the power of intercession. Right? When you pray, uh, what happens? Right? So, so push yourself as leaders. Uh, don't stay in that comfort zone. If you feel that, hey, I've got a good prayer life. I'm praying for one hour a day. Push, push yourself. Right? If you can do one and a half hours, push yourself. Go ahead. Right. Uh, and then what happens is you will see the results in your life. You will see the work of God as leaders. People will recognize the anointing as a cell group leader, as a pastor, or as a just a work, just a person in the workplace. People will recognize the anointing. Right. So build your cell groups in prayer. Next one, let's get into uh, chapter 12, which is the unlimited possibilities of cells. Now, this is basically the different kinds of cell groups. Uh, there's a list here, right? And as of now at APC, what we have is we have family, we have youth boys, youth girls, right? Now, some of the cells that, uh, uh, that life groups that we want to start is special interest groups right so these special interest groups will basically be groups which uh, so for example i am a, a trainer right so we'll find other trainers in the church and we get them together and they, they, they so they've got maybe seven or eight trainers together and they've got the same uh, understanding same skill set and so they they're able to flow together right Another, uh, you know, another one that we'd like to start is the single mums, single mothers cell groups. And this is very important, right? Uh, um, you know, I'm working towards this. There are a couple of uh, single mothers in our church, but I'm just trying to see how to you know, get this done. But these are things that we want to do, right? And of course, men's cell groups, only men, right? Um, uh, and, and and so with with our men's ministry growing uh we want to see start new men's cell groups so it could be only men coming together and just meeting spending time together discussing god's word ministering to each other right um these are certain these groups we haven't really tried right uh, joyful mothers to be music cell groups uh, prayer cell groups, prison cell groups. It's not something that we have tried. Uh, but again, uh, if you want to try it in your ministry, go ahead and try it, right? Uh, there's nothing wrong, uh, uh, you know, to try uh, all, all of these. You can try the prison cell groups, prayer groups, senior adults groups, single cell groups. Uh, but what we have done is basically we've broadly classified it at APC. So we said, okay, youth boys, youth girls, family. Uh, and then we're looking to start these four uh, uh, cell groups as well, right? And then we have people group thinking. So specific interests. This is like their, you know, what I just discussed, uh, special interest groups, right? Uh, and and here, Matthew 10, 5 these 12 jesus sent forth and commanded them saying go into go not into the way of the gentiles and into the city of the samaritans enter ye not now here jesus is telling his disciples where not to go and where not to reach so what he's saying he's saying you concentrate on the house of israel the israelites you concentrate on the jews right uh so jesus he's restricting his disciples and saying Think about people groups. For now, you go and you minister only to the Jews, right? Uh, uh, you understand because why did he say that? Because he understood the culture, their language, the philosophy, so they could go and minister to them. Now picture this: you got these twelve disciples. All of them are Jews. Imagine they go and minister to the Gentiles, and they start saying, "Abraham said this to his forefathers." The Gentiles will be wondering, "Who is Abraham, and why should I know about him?" Right? It just doesn't make sense. So, so Jesus was trying to get them to people think, people group thinking, right? But over time, we see that you know Jesus also ministered to others, and then he, when he gave the commission after he died and he resurrected, uh, he said, "Go into all the world and preach," because the work was done. 
right? So remember that you and I are maybe in cities, and in, in cities, there are different kinds of people with different strategies, uh, with different requirements. Uh, and and there are people who uh, you know who need to be reached we have children we have youth we have teens we have all the, you know families you know, uh, we have uh, divorced widowed so many people and so one of the things that we can do as ministries and as churches is to group people group thinking group people and reach out to them right? uh, now it's not going to be easy uh, i'm not saying that you know you can just get three four people together no uh, it, it may take some time uh, but remember the advantages is they are able to connect with each other right uh, uh, they they have the they may be going through the same challenges they're going through the you know the same things in life so picture this you got two uh, uh you know widowed people and and they're talking they're, they're planning to start a cell group and they're talking and they're sharing about the challenges they are facing and and so each of each of them are saying this is what i'm facing this is what i'm going through and then they realize that hey all of them are going through these problems so it's not only me and so there's this connect they're able to minister to each other they're able to build each other and you know their faith is built and they the end result is they're able to establish a good bonding with with each other right then you got the youth cells now i'll talk a little bit about youth cells uh and something that we do in in apc is initially uh, when we talked about youth cells, we used to give them the freedom, right? So we say, okay, youth cells, you can meet together, you can do what you have to do, right? But build relationships. But over time, we realized that we don't want our youth to just come meet and do, you know, just have coffee or play basketball and just go back, right? Uh, so we, what we emphasize right now uh, now, meaning it's been about seven, eight years now. What we emphasize uh, to our youth is focus on building people up. Focus on touching on the word. Focus on ministering the word, right? Uh, yes, there will be the other things that we want to do, right? Uh, I remember we had this basketball life group. Right, and it's a wonderful group, right? And uh, uh, this was many, many years back, 2015, I think. Basketball life group. So I, I went. I thought, okay, I need to go and see what happens in this youth basketball life group, and it was amazing. You know, I don't play basketball, but I remember going there, and uh, when they all met, they all prayed, right? And I was just sitting and watching. You know, they all prayed, Father, we thank you for getting us all together, and we're going to play the game now. So be with us, and uh, thank you for giving us uh, good health and strength. And beautiful it was. And they started playing the game. They played for about four, half an hour. And after the game, they came back. And the youth leader was so brilliantly. He brought in, you know, the whole aspect of, you know, said, you know, we played a game today, and uh, there were rules that we had to follow. And we just simply, and he just brought in the discussion. It was powerful. And I still remember it. 2015. Uh, and so when you talk about a youth cell, yes, it needs to be uh, you know, something that people would be interested in coming in, right? Uh, but it also needs to edify prayer and edification and building up must be there. Right. So over time we said, okay, you can do what you want to do, meaning you can have basketball, football, you can have a music, uh, worship evening, worship time, but also discuss the Sunday sermons. And now we emphasize that so that you know we know that the youth are being ministered to in terms of the word, right? Uh, now here again, this is a format and it's not a format that we have to follow. It's just a sample format, right? Uh, usually starts with some relaxation time 
right? Food and icebreaker, uh, then the vision statement, discussion of the cell and uh, presentation of the gospel, right? Meaning ministry time and prayer. Now there are groups that, you know, some groups that I know of, they come, they meet, they pray, uh, sorry, they play either an indoor or an outdoor game. After playing, they that's their icebreaker. And then they get into the discussion. Uh, and then they minister and pray with each other. Right. Uh, but it's very fruitful, very, very fruitful, right? Uh, and out of them, out of these youth life groups, many of them have, we had quite a few, uh, you know, uh, first time decisions, people who gave their life to Christ through life group. Right? And it's it's so wonderful, right? And they still continue to be part of APC. So uh, when it comes to youth life groups, be a little relaxed. Uh, you know, don't don't say, okay, now we're gonna have intercession and prayer for one and a half hours. They're not gonna come the next time. Right. So we need to be a little wise on how we uh, handle them, right? But how do we develop and train our youth leaders? How do we develop and train our youth leaders? And this is in context to leading a cell group or or leading anything, you know, a volunteer team, being part of church ministry. How do we develop and train our youth and you know raise up youth leaders? Right. Uh, now I'll just pick up a few points, right? Uh, one is you you spend time in worship. You give them an idea of what worship is, right? You, you tell them, okay, this is what worship is. See, many times we assume that they know what worship is, right? So as leaders, we, we talk to them. We ask them, what is worship? Worship is not five songs. For forty-five minutes, it's it's very little to do about that. Worship, you know, you begin to talk to them, you teach them what is worship about. You're you're begin to develop their thinking. You're helping them to stretch their thinking. It's not only just five songs and it's closed. No, what happens during worship? What can we experience during worship? Uh, how how does the Lord respond to our worship? Right, so you, you talk to them. Then you you give a good message. Or so here, what we do is uh, the Sunday sermons. But you can also, you know, uh, if you're raising up uh, leaders, you you disciple them. You give them opportunities as youth leaders. You teach them. Right. When I say disciple, you don't tell the person that you're trying to minister to. Don't tell them. Listen, from now I'm your. Uh, you are my disciple, and I'm your father. You don't have to say all of that. I mean, what I'm trying to say is you you nurture them into what you want them to be. Don't look at them at their current position or their current you know level of maturity. Remember what Jesus did? Uh, I always wonder how did Jesus have this foresight, right? He looked at Peter the same the same guy who denied Jesus, but he said, you you look after the church. Such a big responsibility. And if I was Peter, I would have said, but Jesus, I was not there with you on the cross. I denied you three times. Uh, are you sure you want to give it to me? Jesus said, yes, you you go, you build, you take the church forward. So you, when you and I disciple our leaders, don't look at them. I remember this. Uh, we many years back, I think it was 2016, uh, 16 or could be 70. I'm not sure. Uh, there was this young youth. There was a youth in church, and uh, you know he had earrings, and he had a tattoo up here on his neck. And uh, uh, no, I'm not saying now you have to have all of that. What I'm trying to say is, he came from a you know from a very difficult background. He, he had gone through his own challenges, drug addiction and all of that. And he came out of it. He was clean and he really loved the Lord. Uh, he gave his heart to Christ, loved the Lord, wanted to minister. Uh, and I told him once, uh, you know, why don't you start a life group? He said, what's a life group? And then I began to 
spend time with him and just uh, share with him. So I connected to a like connected him to a life group. He was there very faithfully serving uh, for more than a year. And I said, okay, it's time for you to start your own life group. Uh, and then, uh, you know, when, when we started the life group, some of them came up to me and said, are you sure he's good enough to be a life group? Because he still wears his, you know, these earrings and all. I said, all of that, you don't worry about all of that. That's all secondary, right? What matters is his heart for God, right? And I remember telling him, uh, you know, telling this person, the other person, uh, that the more he begins to lead the group, the more you will see things coming off. Uh, you'll see those, that there are some things in our life that are not necessary. He'll take it off. So many of them said, are you sure you want to make him the life group leader? I said, yeah, that's OK. Give him opportunities. And he became, he was a wonderful life group leader. He moved on to a different country. Uh, uh, but wonderful life group leader. Raised a good team of uh, youth uh, in a cell group. And it was a very strong cell group. Right. So you never know, you know, when you give an opportunity, you never know what they they can do, right? And you never know how they're able to build people up. So when you and I develop and train our youth, give them opportunities, right? Uh, if, if it's a, a, a youth-led, you know, cell group commands greater commitment and adults will have the passion will never have the passion to reach and care for uh, teens and younger people unless they're given the opportunity unless they're taught about it right so yeah so then we'll go into chapter 13 now chapter 13 is very simple it's a it's a cell health assessment tool so we're not going to go through it so if you look at it uh jim igley's model of upward inward outward and forward so this is a personal uh test not test but a, a, a assessment that cell groups can use right now it's it's just an option if you'd like to use it you can use it right and this is, as we said, uh, as we studied the Jim Igley's model, uh, it was a model used by many churches which saw growth uh, in their life groups, which saw uh, a, a total growth in their ministries as well. So this is something that you can, if you'd like to use, you can probably just take a printout, try it out. Right? If you feel it doesn't work, add more points. If you feel there are certain points, uh, now most of this is geared towards churches in the West. Right, so there may be some things that you may have to remove. Go ahead and do that. But uh, this can give you like a at least an evaluation of what your cell group is and uh, and what you must do, what you must not do, uh, and basically help in the health of the cell group. Right? So if you'd like to, if you're a cell group leader, just take a printout of this, uh, try it out. Right, no harm in trying. Uh, and then you can, you know, uh, build on that. Okay, so let's get into step two: preparing to become a cell leader. Okay, preparing to become a cell leader. The cell leader's personal life. Right. Maintain a strong personal walk with God. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 19. Would anyone like to read that? Oh. Matthew 5 and 19. Go ahead. Anyone can please read. It's on, on the screen. I'm not sure if you can see it. Hope you can see it now. Go ahead. Whosoever, therefore, shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Right. Thank you. So here we see Jesus is teaching us something here. Um, I'm sure you've heard of the saying, right? Practice what, we, what you preach. So here Jesus is saying, 
we have to do before we teach. And we have to live it before we teach it. Right. So about the Pharisees, what is uh, Jesus saying? Matthew 15, 14. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. So it's very important to you know, emphasize on these words here. Before we do, we have to do before we can teach. And we have to live it before we teach it. So how 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 can I uh well, what is it for me as a leader? Remember that if I have to teach, you know, for example, I have to teach somebody, you know what, God answers prayers. Right? As as a life group leader, if I feel that I want to teach about prayer and the power of prayer, now I have to do it before I teach it. I have to pray. I have to be a man or a woman of prayer for me to teach it. Right? And I have to live it before I teach it. So if I say, you know, hey, you know, I want to teach on faith and how, you know, God is a God who, uh, you know, who expects us to walk in faith. And when we walk in faith, uh, he begins to do miracles. Now I have to live it. I have to myself walk in faith. And then I'll be able to teach it to others. Right? And Jesus is saying here to the Pharisees, to the disciples, leave those Pharisees alone. Why? Because they're like the blind leading the blind. They only know how to open the scriptures and talk about it, but they don't do anything. Right? They only know how to open, okay, Isaiah, Jeremiah, they know about the Lord, they know about uh, the, the sacrifices, they know everything. But they are blind. And those who are following them also are blind. So those are strong words. Remember, you and I, you cannot teach something you have not learned or experienced. Right? Now, remember that. So for example, this is limited to certain things, right? Now, for example, the you know end times or rapture. I have not experienced the rapture, but you can still teach it. You know about it, you teach it, right? I have not experienced earthquakes and famines, but I can teach about what's going to happen. Right? So when I'm here we're talking about as leaders, if we are to lead people, I cannot teach something. That I haven't learned and experienced. I mean, I can't teach it. So, for example, if I tell people, hey, you must pray. And if I don't pray, there's no weightage in that word. That's why Jesus is telling, uh, you know, the Pharisees are blind. I mean, they, they know they're wearing all their dress and they know the scriptures, they know the Torah, they know everything. But they're blind because they're teaching something they have not experienced. Isaiah 53 talks about the cross. It talks about uh, you know, Isaiah 6 also talks about unto us a child is born, unto us. They know it, but they're blind. They don't see it. Jesus himself said, if you people know what you are seeing, you know, people, generations, uh, you know, were eager to see what you see, but they were blind. They didn't recognize it. So if you and I have to teach, we got to do it first. If I have to teach it, I have to live it first. This is the best example, you know, at home, especially if you have children. I got to do it before I teach it. Yeah, so my, my, my little one asks me, oh, every day, every day he asks me, oh, you know, he gets up early for school, probably about 6.30 in the morning. So he, asked me, he asked me, what time do you get up? That you know, I'm getting up at 6.30. What time do you get up? I say, I tell him, you know what? I sleep early. So I get up very early. I spend time in prayer. Oh, even I want to do it. Now, he's he wants to do it because I'm talking about it. right? But we also remember to live it out as I teach it at home. If I'm not able to live it out, 
there's no point of me teaching. Right? You cannot lead people where you yourself have not gone. Right? You cannot give something you do not have. Right? And you cannot administer deliverance in areas you yourself are bound in. This is strong, right? You cannot lead people when where you have not gone yourself. If you and I are, you know, you know, people, so for example, you're a worship leader, right? This is an example, right? You're a worship leader. If you feel you and I, right, when I say you, it's if we feel that you know worship, okay, if, if I'm roasted for worship on Sunday, Wednesday, I have to get the song list ready. Set a time for practice on Saturday. Learn the songs really well. Go on Sunday and lead the worship. We cannot lead the people to a place where of intimacy. Why? Because as a worship leader, worship should be your lifestyle. It should be something that you are. It it's in the natural. So you get up in the morning or whatever in the night. You spend time in worship. You just worship the Lord, no instruments, no pads, nothing. You can sing in tune, you can sing out of key, with key, you can change the scales, it doesn't matter. If you go into that place of intimacy, then you will, when you are leading worship in public, you will take people to that place of intimacy. Right? You cannot give something that you do not have. If you, you know, when we read the Old Testament, we look at it, right? God anointed his people. And that anointing went from person to person to person to person. Right? If we do not have something in us, we cannot give it. Because we don't have it. I can only give what I have. Right? And we cannot administer deliverance in areas where we ourselves are bound. Now picture this. Imagine that there's a young boy in your cell group, and he says, "Hey, you know what? Uh, I'm addicted to pornography." He says, "Okay, let me pray for you." But what if you, you know, the cell group leader himself is going through that challenge? I will not be able to administer deliverance because I myself am bound in that area. But what about being suicidal? You know, uh, we can put on a pretense as leaders, but what if we are suicidal? And then somebody else comes and says, hey, I'm suicidal. I will not be able to bring in deliverance in areas where I myself am under bondage. So what is the, what is the solution here? You got to break free from these bondages. Keep progressing in your growth and maturity and Christ likeness. Maintain your spiritual disciplines of worship, prayer, word meditation, word confession, fasting, and fellowship. And these are powerful spiritual disciplines, right? Never compromise these. No matter how high we get into ministry or workplace, wherever we are, never compromise on these. Because your spiritual disciplines is what will keep you and I going strong in ministry. Word meditation, word confession. One of the first things that come to my mind when I wake up, first things, I don't know why, but every, every morning, I, it's just there in my mind. Wake up in the morning. First thing, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills. Where does my help come from? It's just so natural. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of the heavens and the earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is my keeper. The Lord is my shade upon my right hand. The sun shall not smite me by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve my soul. The Lord shall preserve me as I go in and come out from this time forth and even forevermore. What is that? The first thing. It's just wired there. I wake up. 
I will lift up my eyes to the Lord, who is my helper, my strength. And when we maintain these spiritual disciplines, it's what will get us through in our ministry. Fasting, fellowship, worship, prayer. We continue to build on these. Make time. And in a world that we are living in as leaders, it's very easy to say no time. Make time. Make time, right? Then, maintain a life that is constant, constantly consecrated to God. Give no room for the devil in your life. Now, look at this. The devil is, the moment you begin to maintain your spiritual disciplines, if we are not praying, if we're not reading the word, the devil will leave us alone. No problem. He'll say, you do what you want. It doesn't affect me. But the moment we do these things, we maintain our spiritual disciplines. What are we doing? We are taking the work of the devil. Now, the devil wants to bring us down. So you give him no room. You close every door. Will we make mistakes? Yes. Will we sin? Could be. Will we overcome temptations? Yes. Will we fall into temptations at times? Yes. But constant, constantly consecrate yourself to God. I always say this to myself. I don't have to give an account to the devil. I don't have to. All I have to do is come to the cross. I say, God, I messed up. But I thank you. And if your word says, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you. So right now, you confess my sins. And I receive forgiveness. And I know that I'm your child. That's it. It's done. It's finished. Constantly consecrate yourself to God. And be on your guard. When you know that in those verses, um, First Peter 5, 8, um, be on your guard for the devil is like a roaring lion trying to devour. Right. So be on your guard. Look at your life. Look at your weak points. Right now, all of us have weak points and we have strong areas. Right. We have areas that are very strong. So the devil is not going to come there. But he'll choose those weak points in our life. Right. So so if, if you're strong in one area. Continue to grow there, but look at your weak points and be alert on those. Be on your guard. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is like a roaring lion walking about, seeing who he may devour. Get rid of demonic strongholds. Be aware that there is a reality of a spiritual enemy. Right? Uh, the weapons that we fight, we are not wrestling against flesh and blood. But against principalities, powers, and rulers of, of of the heavens, right? There can be strongholds in a believer's life, areas in the soul that are occupied and controlled by demonic spirits. So we get rid of them. Right now, this could be over time. It, it it's not like it can. If it happens at a moment, that's wonderful. But if it takes. If God is taking you through a season, that's where we we need to trust God in the process. Say, God, okay, I'm going to trust in you. Right? And we uh, continue on. I think we'll spend more time on this. So we'll stop here. Next class, we'll begin with uh, get rid of demonic strongholds. We can spend some time here on this chapter and learn more. All right. All right. Thank you so much. I'll see you on Wednesday. Have a great weekend. God bless.